Oh, Dr. Lee asked me to remember this panel. I didn't really know what to do, so I just drew up some, some things that I thought I found unusual in the last uh, few years. And we'll go over that. Um, this is an interesting little story. A couple of years ago, I was thinking, uh, well, maybe in the anomalous heat, we're actually putting the, we're just putting the energy in when we, when we start the experiment. And we're just somehow in unusual conditions are extracting it. So I went over to Joe Schumer at NRL. He's a nuclear physicist, a uh, more of a weapon type guy, and followed this stuff. And I said, Joe, suppose in the uh, in the supernova that uh, form the heavy elements, and some of them, or one or two isotopes, that we never get to the ground state. And so, when you put them in this unusual environment with the high crystal fields and resonances and so on, you remove uh, selection rules, it drops down, you get the energy up, and that's what's going on. <clears throat> and uh, maybe it would be a five or 10 kilovolt level or something, and that's where you got it. And he said, well, that's already happened. He said, TLM 180? I said, what? So yeah, in, indeed, TLM 180 is uh, not in the ground state in, 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 in the form. It's got a, a spin of uh, 9 minus the ground state 1 plus, so you can see why it's forbidden. It's got a lifetime of 10 to the 15 years, but you can tickle it, uh, and it'll drop into the ground state and get that 77 kilovolt hammer. So I said, well, maybe there's more of them. We, we haven't found them. They're very low in energy. And, he didn't think so, but it's just an interesting thought. Um, <clears throat> then, uh, and then uh, only 10 years ago or so, maybe, uh, this one was found by itself. Um, <clears throat> thorium has a uh, metastable level of 7.6 electron volt nuclear excited state for a five hour lifetime. Now that is highly unusual, but it begs the question, can isomers like this play a role in anomalous heat? Now, you can think, you, you know, 7.6 EV, you can imagine that atomic physics will, uh, physics will connect to this. In fact, one of the guys in my group at NRL was doing schemes to try to make a nuclear laser out of this level. So, uh, <clears throat> um, are there any more of them uh, that, that haven't been found that could play a role in this, that you can It'll interact with the atomic uh, lattice. <clears throat> and uh, nuclear structure theory is just probably not up to the task of predicting something uh, on, on this kind of level. In fact, you're, you're happy to be, to be within kilovolts or tens of kilovolts of a level of nuclear structure theory predicting models. <clears throat> so it's an open question. Maybe there's more of these. Maybe they play a role. But it's just, a, just an, interesting, an interesting thing to contemplate. And um, uh, now, I didn't really need this slide, now that uh, Professor Kasagi has given his uh, talk. <laughs> but uh, some of you may not, not have heard or may not know about this. Um, uh, oh, OK, this is John Gold's stuff, really. Um, oh, but it begs, it, it, uh, uh, Rob mentioned this yesterday. So we were thinking about this and said, well, maybe in nuclear structure, there are a few levels that, that were somehow missed because this low energy work was dropped after 1940. So you might investigate this by doing just what John Gall is suggesting, where you, you start hitting a target at low energy and look, uh, and, and not, not using a cyclotron, I'm sorry, John, you go to a, a normal accelerator lab where you can do real time work. and. Um, and you just keep slowly increasing the energy and you see what pops out and see if there's something uh, in there that, that hadn't been discovered. Maybe there's some low levels that, that play a role in this. And you can do it with DPDN or you could do it with Coulomb excitation. Um, but that's just another, another idea. Um, oh, that's, I, just, I just said those words. Uh, now there's uh, unusual uh, uh, halo nuclei. Um, not all of them, I'm sure, have been found right now. Uh, this is taken uh, uh, right now. You can see that there's uh, halo nuclei. I don't know, I have 
number of them have been found. I think I remember uncovering a paper that palladium was suspected to have a halo, one of the isotopes, which would be very interesting, because that could certainly increase uh, cross-sections. And um, let's see. <clears throat> uh, they're metastable, of course, but some of them have, have uh, fairly long lifetimes. And uh, we heard about halos from, uh, from uh, Professor Takahashi today and uh, his, his models. And these were discovered not that long ago either. So, you know, there's new things to be discovered in nuclear structure physics. Uh, oh, this is from, I want to oh, uh, <coughs> Lithium-11, for example, this is showing roughly what the spacings are here. That's a pretty darn big nucleus when you look at it. And, uh, and, and, and um, if there's a cooperative or collective effect of neutrons going to uh, something like lithium, I mean, that this, uh, this halo state is a collective. It, 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 it gets more stable when you add a couple of neutrons to it. So get a couple of neutrons near it, you get a, a very large uh, uh, nucleus to work with. Um, uh, this is from Takahashi, or is this showing, showing some of these correlations in uh, beryllium A and lithium A. But uh, it doesn't have dimensions on, on there, but they're big. It's again talk from Takahashi's work. This one I, I like because it's kind of a model of one of, uh, what's this a model of from Earth's song? Uh, there's different configurations of these halos and they have pretty big dimensions. Uh, several fairings, uh, seven, eight, six, up to eight, almost eight fairings wide. Uh, interesting stuff. So these are, uh, these are formed but, uh, in, 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 in uh, I'm in beam experiments, and uh, I haven't thought much about how they might form in a, in a cold environment. Okay, uh, now uh, Professor Kasagi, he published a paper in 1996 that motivated us to do some work on 3D fusion. And we could really not believe this very much, and I uh, got a DARPA program actually to try to do a coincidence measurement. Now uh, there were severe technical difficulties in the coincidence measurement, but, but in order to do it, we did, uh, we did do a second measurement of this. So we did a, a 150 kilovolt bombardment of TIDX. Uh, Professor Kasagi calculated that the cross-section ought to be less than 10 to, 10 to the minus 17 of the DD fusion cross-section. He measured 10 to the minus 12. So, this just shows you the spectra you expect here under normal, just straight DD fusion. And uh, the secondary reactions you would get in a, in a dense target. And you see that these all get lines in the dense target. But what he detected was this reaction of uh, D getting two Ds and giving off three particles, a helium-3, a proton, and uh, Where's the, the other one, a neutron, or neutron, which we don't detect. So in charged particles, you expect to see um, this kind of uh, yield. And because of the details of the experiment, it's hard to measure down here because of all, all a lot of other things going on. So you're really just looking for this, this part of the proton <coughs> spectrum here. And this was our target that Dave Nagel kindly provided years ago. <laughs> And we, uh, uh, and we look for uh, artifacts of signal caused by neutrons and gamma detector artifacts, like incomplete charge collection, uh, reactions with impurities, particle, particle emission from this crack target, for example. We could have the beam go in deep, make a reaction, and come out at an angle, and it would look like it came out of a blow and give you a false signal. We checked that that wasn't the case. And this is a example. These runs take a long time. That's 241 millicoulombs. I think President Kasagi can appreciate that. And um, uh, you, you put a, uh, 
energy in, you put a foil here to stop the elastic scattering, 170 kilovolt D, and then the high energy particles make it through. And uh, in this case, these are the anomalous counts. And this is the normal signal from uh, uh, D, let's see, helium-3, right? Yeah. D helium-3 builds up in time because you, you build up, you get this so long, you build up helium-3 in the target, and then you're hitting helium-3 with deuterium, but that gives you a piece. <coughs> so then, whoops, what happened to that? Huh. Well, let me see. <laughs> Okay, so, yeah, I do. Well, what I'll try to explain here is that uh, we, <clears throat> these are uh, the different three corrections that I just told you about, and this is the signal. And these two, this did not have a detector collimator on it. We wanted to see the effect of the detector collimator. We put the detector collimator on and improved our signal to noise. But at this stage, we had hit these things for so long, and it's an expensive two millimeter thick silicon detector with radiation damage, it sort of killed its uh, resolution, replaced the detector, and now you see these corrections are much smaller than, than the signal. And so, so we basically confirmed what, uh, what uh, Juro had measured years ago, that, that this is a, a, in two labs now, have shown that this is a real anomaly. And uh, this was the geometry we were going to use for the, uh, it didn't work out for, uh, for technical reasons. Oops. Well, it looks like I left out the one that uh, shows our data along with uh, Kasagi's, but it's basically 10 to minus, a few 10 to the minus 5 of the DD cross section is, uh, is, the, is the cross section. It's 12 orders of magnitude against. Uh, we don't really have an explanation for it. Like Peter Hagelstein is a co-author on it. He was very angry at me for not publishing this. We did this uh, back in 2002 or 2003. And there was a, a problem with the data that it didn't sort out until just last year. Realized it was okay, we published it. And um, so these are, these are unusual. Um, Peter, Peter wanted to, uh, wanted him to say, okay, that's proof that there's some unusual something of uh, uh, excitation in the solid state that gets two Ds pretty close together, and this is a tech, this is a detector for coming in and, and finding those two Ds close together. That, that's one way to interpret it. So <clears throat> now, lot, so so this is a summary, but I did uh, want to take uh, one more. I, I thought of while I was sitting here as one more item that really is directed at uh, the University of Missouri guys. Um, which I thought would be a good thing a long time ago. I suggested this in a paper five years ago, seven years ago. Um, but why not turn this back around? If, if you suspect this is a nuclear, a nuclear phenomenon, and you have the techniques you have here at Missouri, for example, let's put in a radioactive isomer into palladium deuteride, into the surface. You can maybe ion implant it and activate it, or or uh, diffuse in, uh, an, uh, get it into the near surface, do the electrolysis, and then count, and see if you see anything unusual, like a change in the lifetime, or, or, uh, or, or change in some branching ratio, to double man, that sort of thing. Just, just then, then you're presenting a real nuclear situation to that unusual environment, and then you want to look and see, well, is there anything unusual there? That's just the, uh, yeah. So, um, so that's my parting comment, and I think these are really interesting. I don't know if they play any role in what we're interested in, but it's just, uh, 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 well, it, uh, not all the nuclear structure is known. That's what really it's telling you. There's probably more to find. Thank you. Thanks to our speaker. Now we have five minutes for discussion. Well, you can probably add the uh, trivium work that uh, I don't know if I who did it, but a long time ago, the, the page of the uh, like, yeah, right. yeah, right, 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 yeah. 
And um, so that's that's something to put on there. That's much more Would you explain that a little more? You mean? Uh, much more difficult experiment because true. But yeah, it's a uh, enhanced decay rate. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I'm, I'm aware of that. Yeah, okay. 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 Yeah, thank you for reproducing uh, the chart again. But <coughs> just one question. Did you do the consensus experiment? No, I, we had some technical difficulties. Um, we had this KMAX um, equipment that's designed for high energy physics because you needed one of these five detectors to do it and fast timing, fast coincidence timing. And the preamplifiers and the, uh, the uh, gating signals that went with that. And we couldn't get the noise out of it. Uh, they're not meant for, for low count rate experiments. They, they, that with those systems, and we needed the new modules, which are very low noise, very good, and we just didn't have the equipment, and we, we ran out of time and money to, to really get it going. But we designed the experiment uh, on how you would do it. Uh, Peter actually did some calculations for us to make sure we had angles right on our detectors to try to do it. And I think it's a, not an easy experiment, but, but you, could, you could do it. And uh, um, didn't, get it, didn't get it done. Graham, is given those low energies in the uh, isomers that you identified, uh, do any of the permeation experiments, the sorts of things that uh, Lipson was doing with thin films and uh, thermal excitation, does that provide you any? I mean, he treated those as though they were micro accelerators with large currents. Does that help in bringing up experiments to uh, look at that kind of stuff? No, I, I think he he was measuring anomalous, uh, like 300 MeV protons and 15 MeV alphas when he struck these special sandwiches he made with electrons, right? Is that the experiment you're talking about? No, I'm talking about the ones where he was using the CR39s that surrounded it with aluminum and copper to identify yeah, the particles. But he, but he, but but he, he, was, he was basically letting the uh, gas uh, move through the material. And that was the, uh, and oh, he was, con he was, he was, he was uh, saying that the Palladium deuterated oxide layer um, was, in fact, the target, and the flow of, of the deuterium through the material was essentially the beam. And he was computing, you know, the sorts of energies he would get there. And I'm just wondering whether or not, given those low energies, whether or not you'd have enough energy there to do a similar kind of experiment with your. I I, uh, I don't know. I, I don't know enough about what you're talking about to intelligently intelligently comment. Like, yeah. We are talking very interesting right now. <laughs> we have to go to the third speed.